How are you? Okay, so it's now three o'clock. So we're gonna start the Zoom now. So I want to say good day, everyone, and welcome to our Forlum Foundation Forum today, titled Growing Your Own Food for Health and Security. Um, I'd like to introduce myself, introduce myself. My name is Keisha Lynch, and I am the administrator for Sills Dialysis in Belleville. And I also do work for the Forlum Foundation. Um, just a little bit about the Forlum Foundation. Um, the Forlum Foundation is a charitable organization based in Carrington Village, Barbados. The focus of the foundation is on reducing the number of persons progressing to end-stage kidney disease, which requires dialysis or a kidney transplant. Free kidney testing is offered weekly through the foundation, and to date, a thousand Barbadians have been tested and know their kidney function status. The overall aim of the Forlum Foundation is to provide quality primary health care service, which includes free diagnostic testing for the most prevalent non-communicable diseases in our society, as well as health services and educational programs. So the Fordham Foundation Forum is one of those educational programs. And I would like to extend a special welcome um, to the members of the Barbados Kidney Association. Your constant support is much appreciated. Also, a warm welcome to anyone who's joined our Zoom family for the very first time today. Welcome, thank you very much for joining. And I just want you to know that the Forlum Foundation Forum is committed to supporting our community through information on health, non-communicable diseases, and especially kidney disease, as we are connected to SILS dialysis. Um, we thought today's topic was important though, um, which is growing your own food for health and security, as we are currently living in very volatile times, as we all know, food prices are rising consistently due to inflation caused by situations out of our control. So we're also seeing a rise in NCDs, which are non-communicable diseases, which is caused by cultural unhealthy eating practices. So now, today we have a very special guest, one of our newest senators in Barbados, Senator Dr. Chelston Brathwaite, who is an expert in agriculture, having spent 50 plus years working in agricultural development and food security. He's worked as an, an administrator, as a researcher, a lecturer, technical and advisor, and as Barbados' ambassador to China. So Dr. Brathwaite's bio is very, very extensive and we welcome him and we are very grateful to have him today to um, give us some guidelines as to how we can go about starting our own kitchen gardens. So I would like to extend a warm forum welcome to Dr. Senator Dr. Chelston Brathwaite today. So, we would like to start off. Thank you, Keisha, and I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bathwit. So we are going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to just share um, some clips just so you can get some context about what we're going to speak about. So just give me one second and let me share the very first clip that I'm going to share with you today. start a garden, you must decide where to locate in relation to your property. One of the critical factors to take into consideration is that plants require a minimum amount of light for good growth and production. Most plants require about six hours of continuous sunshine every day in order to grow well. Some plants, Chinese cabbage and lettuce, can tolerate some amount of shade. But generally speaking, most plants require that six hours of sunshine, like beans, like tomatoes, and other plants, cucumbers, etc. In order to ensure that, therefore, we wish to ensure that the place in your property where you're going to locate your garden has this characteristic. It is not covered by large trees, and therefore you have the possibility of having that amount of sunshine. The other factor that is critically important is the availability of water and the availability of good soil. The soil is very important because plants require 
nutrients from the soil. You may plant in a bed or you can plant in pots, depending on your location and the availability of space. If you have limited space, you will decide to plant your plants in a plant pot. If you use a plant pot, one of the critical factors to remember is that plants planted in a pot must ensure that there is good drainage, that the water that is given to the plant is able to penetrate the soil and exit the soil. So most plant pots, you will notice, are made with holes in the bottom of them. It is important not to block those holes, but to ensure that when the plant is watered, that the water can pass through the soil and exit the, the, the pot in, in order to maintain a level of aeration for the roots of the plant. The plant require air, oxygen in order to survive. In that regard, we believe therefore it's important to consider the availability of light, the availability of water, and the availability of good soil. Okay, so that was our very first clip. And that was just gardening 101. So we know about soil, we know about aeration for um, plant pots. And so I'm going to move on to the very next clip. Let me first share again, one second, share the screen. So our, what we're gonna do now is weed control. Again to my garden and today we're going to talk about the maintenance of the garden. It is important in maintaining the garden to consider three basic elements. First of all, weed control. Weeds tend to grow wherever you plant your vegetables and they compete with your vegetables for nutrients and space and light. It is therefore important to remove them. In my experience, I have used a small hand rake, which allows me to dig the beads out of the soil <laughs> and remove them effectively from the garden. This is very important because in doing so, you in fact provide the plants with additional room for growth and remove the competition, such as these weeds, which compete in this case with the beans for space. That was a rather short clip, my apologies, but um, Dr. Brathwick does go on in that clip to speak about pest control, which we will get into later in this Zoom. I just want to give a bit more context. So we're going to do just two more short clips and then we're gonna get started. So we're gonna do container gardening. Second. Here in this garden, we start with an aspect that I think is very relevant to our business situation, container gardening. Because there are a lot of people who say, well, I don't have any space. I, I really can't have a backyard garden. Yes, you can. Because all that is needed is a container in which you hold soil. And in that soil, you can plant anything. I have an extreme case here. Keisha. Yes. Yeah, are you are you sure you the, the um oh my apologies you're not not seeing it. <laughs> sorry thank you so much for telling me oh my gosh one second <laughs> let me let me just fix that just one second your screen thank you so much for letting me know Okay, so let's start container gardening again. One second. Is everybody seeing it okay? Let me start with an aspect that I think is very relevant to Barbados. Yeah, you can see it now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there are a lot of people who say, well, I don't have any space. I have yes, you can. Because all that is needed 
is a container in which you hold soil. And in that soil, you can plant anything. I have an extreme case here. My old shoes, I don't throw them away. This is an example of kale growing in an old shoe. The shoe is filled with soil. You put in the kale and it will grow. This is container gardening. But the real, the real effect can be seen here in sweet potato, which I have in container. And I have the containers, the mixture was half of ash from the Sufri volcano and half soil mixed together in these containers. And you can see how the sweet potato is growing. I am looking forward to having a good product coming out of this exercise. In front of this, you see, I have tomato seedlings growing that I just got some potted mix and I'm going to grow tomatoes here. So on this side, I'm going to have sweet potato and tomatoes growing right here. As I move around, I can show you a lot more. On that side, I grow my herbs. I have a baby tree. I have lemongrass. I have what we refer to as Chinese chive. I have mint. I have the traditional broadleaf thyme. And I have marjoram, which is very common. As I go on the other side, I can show you what I grow in the traditional bed. I have lettuce <laughs> and beans. I also have sweet potato. Sweet potato. If we are here, I should tell you about my rabbit. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to show you the rabbits, but in, a, in the interest of time, we're just going to keep moving on. So one last clip, and that is going to be on compost, composting. So I think this is something very important that we should all learn about because we all have kitchen scraps that we can use. So just one second. Let me just share this very last clip, and then Dr. Brathwood is going to speak. One second. On this side, on this side, can everybody see? I also do something. Yes. I would like yes. to show Barbados. Yes. Thank you. In this bucket, I collect the waste from my kitchen fruit peels, eggshells, etc. And what do I do with it? I bring it here. And I have a system now where I take this waste. I put it into an old blender that I stole from my wife in the kitchen. And all the eggshells and all the kitchen waste, I put it in the blender and I blend it. Having blended it, the blended mixture, which is very much like a soup, I pour it into this bucket of soil. And with time, the liquid from that passes through the soil. The particles are retained by the soil and it comes down and nutrify 
fertilize this plant. So the plant grows on the basis of the liquid that comes from the organic waste from the kitchen. Nothing is thrown away. You will know there are no flies, no bad odors, or nothing to worry about. The waste has been converted into a soluble product that filters through the soil and gives nutrients to the plant. This is an example of something that I've developed here, which I think could be used by many persons in Barbados to reduce the amount of waste that is left on the side of the road, use the kitchen waste productively to return the organic matter to the soil. To be successful in establishing Okay, so as you can see, gardening, home gardening can be extremely sustainable as well for the environment. So I'm now going to turn everything over to Dr. Brathwit and let him explain a little bit about how we can go about creating our home gardens. Like now you have a little bit of context on what we're doing. Go ahead, Dr. Brathwit. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, Loud and clear. Yes. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Let me begin good by afternoon. thanking Keisha yes, Lynch yes. and the Forum Foundation for inviting me here this evening to say a few words <laughs> about home gardening and growing your own food. I am sorry for those of you who I have disturbed your Sunday afternoon rest in order to engage in this exercise. But let me admit to you that I'm convinced that in today's world, it will be worth it. I'm on a mission. The mission is to help Barbadians grow more of what we consume, especially fruits, vegetables, and herbs. And as a mission, it is of critical importance that the message is clear and that the strategies are understood and that everybody is on the same page. And that one understands why should you produce some of your own food? Why produce some of your own food when you can buy it from the supermarket? This is a question that comes up every once in a while. People say, well, you know, I can go to Massey and get whatever I want. Why should I go through the trouble of growing my own food? Let me give you a couple of reasons why you should grow your own food. And then let us see how you can do it. First of all, when you grow your own food, you reduce your food bill. This is important because food prices are currently on the rise and are projected to rise even further. When you grow your own food, you know where your food comes from. You know how it is grown. You know that it is not contaminated with dangerous pesticides. Fresh fruits and vegetables are critical for good health. You get the satisfaction of utilizing your creativity in producing something that you have seen grow from seed to maturity. And if you produce good healthy food, you spend less money at the doctor. This is important because all the evidence suggests that a healthy diet rich in fruits and vegetables with all the nutrients that this imply is a fundamental requirement for healthy living. I want to share with you some of the context of a recent draft book that I'm preparing on home gardening in Barbados. It is basically a guide for home gardeners that I'm preparing. 
And I wish to quote from the draft book. And I'm looking forward to getting responses from you to help me in improving the draft. Let me quote a few things from the draft, which I think will support what I'm trying to say about home gardening. The results of a recent study suggest that gardening can improve physical, psychological, and social health. And from a long-term perspective, alleviate and prevent various health issues facing today's society. We therefore suggest that government and health organizations should consider gardening as a beneficial health intervention and encourage people to participate more in gardening as a basis for regular exercise. To do so, policymakers need to increase people's opportunity and motivation to engage in gardening activities. The former requires enough space where people can enjoy gardening, and the latter suggests the needs and advantage of gardening to be made available to a wider population. Recently, because of COVID, a lot of us have been confined to our homes in lockdown and uh, social distancing and the various measures that have been used to control the disease. Some people have suffered from depression, various forms of anxiety and mental illness. Some were unable to go to the gym and to get exercise. Some were unable to go walking. Some were unable to go for a swim. And I can tell you that if you check around, people who have had a garden in their homes did not suffer from any of these serious side effects of COVID. What do I mean by that? Well, let me quote from the book and tell you what I mean. According to chapter one of my book, gardening heals the mind and the body. The activity of gardening provides exercise by weeding, planting, pruning, forking, and other acts of caring for plants. The act of gardening provides relaxation from stress as the activities involved allows one to use parts of the brain that you don't normally use in your everyday activity in an office or other places of employment. The act of gardening provides a connection with nature and the satisfaction derived from seeing things grow from seed to maturity provides a sense of achievement. The act of gardening provides a base for conversation, especially among the elderly. It's an opportunity to learn new things about nature, about biology, and how the wonders of plant growth contribute to human satisfaction. In my view, there should be a garden in every home in Barbados. Gardens provide youth with a sense of purpose, achievement, and an understanding of the wonders of science and the environment. The most important part of gardening, however, is that it provides the opportunity to share knowledge acquired and to share the fruits of the garden with family and relatives. This sharing strengthens relationships and helps to build community. We recommend there should be a garden as a place of relaxation, a place of sharing, a place of inspiration, a place of happiness, and a place of peace. Let me share with you some recent research, which I think is important for us as we move forward. There's a gentleman called Mr. Dan Butter, a journalist and explorer, and he traveled the whole world gathering information on the secrets of the world's oldest and longest living people. And he found one thing that they all had in common in the areas that he investigated were gardens. He went to what are called the blue zones. He went to Okinawa, Okinawa in Japan. He went to Nicoya in Costa Rica. 
He went to Icaria in Greece. He went to Loma Linda in California. He went to Sardinia in Italy. To me, the only place he did not go is he did not come to Barbados. And I would recommend that for him or to him for his next visit. In all of these places where it has been shown that people have long lives, longevity is characteristic of all the places that I have mentioned, he found one characteristic that was true. Most of the people in those locations had gardens. In Okinawa, they say anybody who grows old in a healthy state must have an ikigai or a reason for living. And gardening can provide that one thing that you can get up and do every day, something to get up for, something to do with your life. Pulling, fluff, pulling weeds, nurturing plants, provides that sense of a link with nature that is so important for living. So if you want to live long, according to this gentleman, and you want our president to come and drink wine with you at 100, you should have a garden. Plant a garden and grow some food. Now, what about gardening and non-communicable diseases? In recent times, we have heard a lot about these diseases, hypertension, diabetes, kidney failure, high blood pressure, cancer, you name it. Eight out of every 10 deaths in Barbados are caused by these chronic non-communicable diseases. And there is some interesting work that was done. And I want to refer to some work done by the United Nations system. Over the last 25 years, notable changes have occurred with respect to food and nutrition in the Caribbean. In the past, we had a diet that was basically traditional. People ate edos, people ate breadfruit, people ate sweet potatoes, people ate yams. With time, that traditional diet has been supplanted by a diet of processed foods from abroad. Processed foods that contain high levels of sugar, salt, trans fats, hormones, and other additives. So we have replaced the traditional diet, which contain what are now called many good complex carbohydrates with processed foods from abroad, which contain significant amounts of undesirable nutritional components, including sugar, salt, glutamate, and other things that contribute to poor nutrition. It is not surprising that we report high mortality due to these nutritional related diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, stroke, cancer, kidney failure, and all the others. And recent reports suggest that obesity, which is increasing in our country, is very much related to our diet. 30% of all Adults in our country are overweight. Available, indicate, available evidence indicate that chronic disease problems are growing rapidly in the region. And Barbados has the highest prevalence of diabetes in the Americas and double the world's affliction rate. So we are not health-wise, we are not in a good place. And in fact, the recent decision by government to tax the products with high sugar levels in the country, which has generated a significant amount of discussion, is a step in the right direction, in my view, if for no other reason than to bring to the attention of the Barbados population 
that health-wise, we are not in a good place. And Keisha can tell you of the amount of money that is being spent in this country controlling kidney disease and the amount of money spent on dialysis and the amount of people who are afflicted by the disease. The incidence of these diseases is high. And it's not only death. We, we think sometimes that it's death that is the major problem. It is also lack of productivity. People can't go to work because they don't feel well. They have to go to the doctor because they're suffering from high blood pressure and diabetes. That reduces our productivity and reduces our competitiveness in terms of the ability of the country to succeed. In 2011, a high-level meeting was held at the United Nations in New York to discuss the need for a global attack on chronic non-communicable diseases. And according to the UN documents, cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, diabetes is responsible for 60% of all deaths all over the world, 60% globally. The conference concluded that one of the risk factors that contribute to the incidence of these diseases is the increased consumption of processed foods and ready to serve meals that are rich in trans fats, saturated fats, salt, and sugar. Furthermore, the meeting indicated that chronic non-communicable diseases are a threat to development as these diseases contribute to high health care costs. And you can ask the government of Barbados, how much are we paying for health care in this country? And what is the cost of these diseases at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and at the clinics around the country? They contribute to low productivity and increasing levels of poverty because of the amount of money that people have to spend in trying to control them. According to one UN expert, and I quote, he said, if we are serious about tackling the rise of cancer, the rise of diabetes, and the rise of heart disease, we, meet, we need to make ambitious and binding commitments to tackle one of the root causes. One of the root causes, according to him, is the food we eat. That's one of the root causes of our problem, the food we eat. In other words, we are eating ourselves to death by eating the wrong thing. And these are conscious decisions. This is not COVID that is attacking you. This is not tuberculosis that is attacking you. This is not dengue that is attacking you. You are eating. You are choosing to eat the wrong things, shortening your life, and creating health problems for yourself. These are voluntary actions that you can do something about. And I think that's the message that has to be conveyed when we try to tackle these diseases nationally and globally, that there are things that are within your control, but you don't control them. You choose to eat the wrong things that damage your own health. And then you go pay the doctor. So you lose on both sides. You lose in terms of the cost of the food you buy that is not good for you. And then you lose because you have to pay the doctor and then you go and you have to get dialysis and you have to get tablets and you have to get all these treatments that cost money. So you're spending a significant amount of your income on disease control, consciously or unconsciously. And it is all within your power because it is the food you eat. It is the choices you make that results in the rampant rise of these chronic non-communicable diseases in our country. And therefore it is important that as we seek to do something about these diseases, that we educate our people that the answer lies in your hands and not in the government hands, it is your hands. 
because you decide what you're going to eat. And if you decide to eat the processed and ready done food that contain high salt, high sugar, contaminants, hormones, preservatives, et cetera, and damage your own health, you have no one to blame by yourself because it's your decision. Now, getting into my topic a little deeper, why should you grow some of your own food? I don't think you can grow everything, but there are things that you can grow. And one of the, the things that you can grow that is significantly important for good health is fresh fruits and vegetables. So what are the eight reasons that you should have a garden? One, to provide you with fresh organic vegetables at home, to provide exercise as a gardener. You get up in the morning and you go take care of your plants, you get some exercise. To contribute to reducing waste by composting, to provide relaxation, tranquility, and peace of mind, to contribute to reducing your food bill, to reduce your medical bill, less frequent visits to the doctor, reduce the incidence of NCDs, and to provide for long life so that you can reach 100 and the president can come and drink wine with you. And if that's one of your goals, you should begin to look at your health from now. Don't wait until you get to 100 because you probably wouldn't get to 100 unless you take care of your health now. So how do you start a garden? Well, the first thing you have to do is you decide what kind of garden you want. Do I want a garden with vegetables alone? Do I wish a herb garden? Do I wish a garden with flowers? Do I wish a flower garden and a vegetable garden mixed together? Or do I want to incorporate into my garden some other elements, for example, growing of rabbits and the production of fish, which is one of the characteristics of my garden. I grow tilapia and I have rabbits and I grow vegetables. Do you wish to practice hydroponics, which means basically growing your plants in water, in a nutrient solution, or do you, wish, do you wish to grow them in soil? Do you wish to combine vegetable growing and the growing of fish, something today we call aquaponics? How much space are you prepared to dedicate to a garden? And how much time do you have? Gardens require space, they require time. You have to decide on the location of your garden. Where are you going to locate the garden? What is the size of the space that you have available to you? How do you want your garden beds to be located? Will you be using irrigation or will you be using a watering can? Are you prepared to invest in the basic tools for gardening? You'll need at least a hand fork, a shovel, garden rake, a watering can, and some other simple tools. You need to prepare the area where you plan to put your garden by removing the stones. And you should try to garden on a flat area rather than an area that is sloping. If however, you do not have anything else but a sloping area, then that is where you're going to put your garden, then that is what has to be done. Prepare the soil, ensure there's adequate drainage. Do not prepare your garden in a low lying area where you're going to get water locked, where the water is going to settle. Plant the care, so that you do not damage the roots of your seedlings. Visit your garden regularly to ensure the plants are doing well, remove weeds, control pests and diseases, water and fertilize as needed. Now let me speak about the need for sunlight. Almost all vegetables and most flowers need six to eight hours of sunlight every day. You cannot plant your garden under a big tree. 
and expect it's going to do well. No, it is not going to do well. While it is true that some shade may be necessary, plants do require that six to eight hours of light every day. It is therefore essential to plant your garden, taking into consideration the light needs of your plant. If you're going to plant on a slope, you have to ensure that you do not have erosion of the soil. You have to plant across the slope rather than in line with the slope. If you plant in line with the slope, water will come from the rain, will wash all your soil down to the lower levels. So you must plant across the slope. In a real sense, if you're planting in soil, there are certain tips that are critically important to consider. One of the first tips you must consider is that you should choose a relatively flat place because it is more difficult, time consuming and expensive to create a garden on sloping land. You must improve your soil with organic matter, mature, I mean manure, decaying leaves, dry glass, grass clippings, chicken manure, rabbit manure, cow manure. All of these things are important to improve the organic matter in your soil. Plants do well in soil that has high organic matter content. Earthworms will contribute to the decay of the organic matter and release nutrients for the soil. In that way, you use less fertilizer if you have a soil that is high in organic matter. You cannot have a sustainable garden without add adding some organic matter to the soil. You must till the soil, turn the soil up when you prepare new beds. That allows for air to enter the soil so that the roots have access to aeration and access to water and nutrients. In the absence of aeration, plants are unable to take up the nutrients from the soil. If the soil is waterlogged, plants will not be able to take up the nutrients from the soil. And this is very important because we have seen the situation where we have many persons who are very effective in killing plants. And they do not do it intentionally. Sometimes they do it over an abundance of enthusiasm. They wet the plant in the morning, they wet it at midday, and they wet it in the night. The plant becomes waterlogged and it dies. Or you have the other extreme, they wet it on Monday, and they don't wet it until next Friday, the plant dies. And then you begin to complain, I had this beautiful plant that I bought at a flower shop and I brought it here and I put it in soil and I gave it all the care that I could and the plant died. You don't want to be a person who orchestrates the death of plants. You want to be a gardener. And a lot of people who you say have green thumb, I mean, they don't really have any green thumb. It's just that they, plant, they, they understand what the plant needs and they provide the needs for the plant. Plants require fertile soil. They require water. They require sunlight. And they require your attention because you have to remove the evidence of pests and diseases. You should handle your seedlings. If you're buying seedlings, you should handle them very carefully. Seedlings are like babies. You have to handle them with care. You can't throw the seedlings into the trunk of the car and leave them there for two days. And then you go take them out and put them to grow and expect them to grow. Meanwhile, the car has been in the sun all day. The plants are probably half baked. And then you put them in the soil. I don't understand why these plants don't grow. Well, they're not going to grow because they have been in the trunk of your car over the last 48 hours. The car is in the sun all day. You forgot them in the trunk and then you expect the plants to grow. 
plants are living organisms and living organisms, as you know, require a particular environment in which to thrive. They need the basic elements. You as a person require good nutrition. So does the plant. You as a person require an appropriate environment. So does the plant. They are living organisms and because they're living organisms, you have to treat them as if they are alive. So you have to treat your seedlings with care, just as you would treat a baby. You can't damage the roots and expect them to grow. You have to keep them moist at all times. High moisture in seedlings is critically important. And you have to carefully plant them in the soil, providing them with the appropriate nutrients and water. Don't overwater, but also don't underwater because the plants need water. But do not put the seedling in a pot without a hole in the bottom. The plant will become waterlogged and it will not grow. It will die because the plant roots require oxygen in order to absorb the nutrients for growth. So you have to have holes in the bottom of the pot so that when you add water, the soil can drain out and oxygen is available to the roots of the plant. If the, if the plants do not get oxygen, the roots will eventually rot and the plants will die. You must cover the soil for moisture control with a mulch. The mulch could be dried grass, clippings from your lawn, or there's something called weed block that is sold in hardware stores, which is very effective in controlling weeds and preserving moisture. If you buy the weed block or use a mulch, you, lead, you need to water less frequently. It also helps to control the weed growth and therefore gives you a clean garden. Let's talk a little bit about the control of pests and diseases. Pests and diseases are a natural part of a garden. When you put your plants in the soil, there are other things that are interested in your plants. They're called pests and diseases. Loopers, melon worm, fruit worm, diamondback moth, aphids, leaf miner, mealy bugs. All of these are watching your plants and wanting to get a piece of the action. So unless you are alert and you're taking care of your plants, these pests are going to take care of them for you. And they will take care at your expense because you will get up one morning and the plant has no leaves. This is very characteristic of the slugs. The slugs come out at night, so in the day you see the plant looking nice and healthy, and then the next morning you see the plant has no leaves. You say, what happened overnight? Slugs live in the soil, normally under decaying organic matter, in moist conditions. They go to sleep during the day, and they come out at night to feed. So when you're sleeping, they're eating, and they will eat your plants unless you take appropriate precautions. Now, in the case of slugs, of course, you can get slug bait to put around the plant, but a more effective way is to get up in the night and go kill the slugs. I do it in my garden. The slugs come out at eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I go just before going to sleep, go down in the garden, and you see these critters coming out, you take care of them and you have healthy plants. But there are a lot of other little things that you can do to help. One of the things that I have recommended, which works very well, is get a gallon bucket of water and put a teaspoonful of dishwashing liquid, a teaspoonful of bicarbonate of soda. Mix it well. You may wish to crush a bulb of garlic in it and spray it on the plants. That takes care of a lot of insects that attack your plants. And these things are not toxic to you, friendly to the environment, and you get some control of a lot of pests. 
or you could use something called bioneem, which is very common in the plant stores. It is an organic botanical insecticide that is made from the neem tree. I'm sure a lot of you know the neem tree. The neem tree produces a natural insecticide that scares away many of the insects that would be in your garden. As a matter of fact, you can collect neem leaves and you can treat it in water, squeeze it and make a, a soup that you can spray on plants and that scares away a lot of insects also. But if not, you can buy something called bioneem and you put about a teaspoonful of that into a gallon of water with a little bit of um, liquid soap, dishwashing liquid. What the dishwashing liquid does is it acts to assist the chemical in penetrating the leaves. It almost like a sticker. And that also is able to kill things like aphids. They do not like the soap liquid. You can also plant marigold. Marigold is known to be a very effective way of controlling nematodes, which are the little worms that attack the roots of your plants. And um, you can plant marigolds in between your plants. But a very important way of controlling pests also is you must do crop rotation. Don't plant the same crop all the time in the same place. If you had beans here this time, next time plant okras in that same spot. And if you had carrots there, next time plant beets in that spot. Because as you rotate the crops, you break the cycle, the life cycle of the pests and diseases that will attack that crop. And therefore you create an environment in which you are not only rotating the crop for nutrient benefits, you're also rotating the crop to control pests and diseases. So crop rotation is important. Don't plant the same thing in the same place all the time. And if the last time you plant a shallow rooted crop, like lettuce in one bed, next time plant a deep rooted crop. Why? That allows you to exploit the soil profile because shallow rooted crops will feed on the first two to three inches of the soil, like lettuce. But deep-rooted crops like okra and carrots will feed lower down in the first six to eight inches of soil. So you exploit the whole, the whole soil profile and you're able to renew the nutrient status of the soil by rotation, rotating a shallow-rooted crop with a deep-rooted crop. That is all part of ensuring that the richness of the soil benefits your garden. It is important to have appropriate spacing for your plants. Don't plant the plants all jumbled up together, otherwise each of them will be competing with each other. For example, Chinese cabbage should be planted eight inches apart, at least lettuce at least 10 inches apart. Sweet pepper, 18 inches. Cabbage, about 15 inches. Tomatoes, about 18 inches. This allows for the space that is necessary for the roots to grow. Because what you see above ground is not all that is in the plant. Don't forget that below ground is a root system that is exploiting the soil that supports that plant. And therefore, that root system must have sufficient space and soil volume to provide the nutrients necessary to grow. So don't bunch the plants all together. Give them the appropriate space. And in my book, I indicate the spacing that is generally used for these plants. Now let me tell you about com combining fish and plants, aquaponics. Aquaponics basically is a new technology that is now becoming very common here in Barbados where people are growing vegetables and fish together. The idea is that fish grown in water, as they are grown, produce ammonia. Ammonia and urea is a natural excrement of fish. That ammonia and, and urea can be used to fertilize plants. But you can't put the fish and the plants together. 
So what you do is you grow the plant, you grow the fish in a container, and then you move that water to a plant bed where you have your plants grown. In between the two, a process takes place that is very important for plant growth. The ammonia, which is produced by the fish, is broken down into nitrates. Plants cannot use ammonia. <clears throat> plants use nitrates. So there are bacteria in the system that break down the ammonia from the fish into nitrates for the plant. The other thing about fish is that the ammonia which they produce is itself toxic to the fish. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we allow the ammonia to accumulate in the fish tank and don't remove it, it will kill the fish eventually. This is an ecosystem that requires attention to what we call eco-balance. You have to balance the ecosystem in such a way that both the fish and the plants live and the bacteria thrive. Another important aspect of it is the pH level. pH is the level of acidity or alkalinity in a solution. Most plants and most animals thrive at what is called pH 7, where it is neutral. If the pH falls too low, then your solution is getting, getting acid, then many plants will not thrive and many animals will die. So you need to maintain a neutral pH for the growth of the plants and the growth of the fish. How do you do that? You do that by monitoring the water quality. And if the water quality falls below the desired level of pH 6 normally, you add some calcium hydroxide in order to raise the pH. Um, aquaponics requires attention and an understanding of what you are doing. If you understand it, it is a very lucrative way and a very interesting way of producing both fish and vegetables together. We can talk a lot more about that because it is becoming so important today because what you do is you use the same water. You do not require any additional water. The plants get water on a daily basis. You don't have to water them. Now, not every plant will tolerate its roots growing in water. Lettuce, spinach, um, kale, there are a few plants that will survive, others will not, and you need to know which ones will. The yields in aquaponics are normally higher than in the normal soil. Your return on investment can in fact be better. But again, as I said, you have to pay attention, you have to understand the needs of the plants and the needs of the fish, and you have to balance those requirements. Well, let's talk a little bit about container gardening. There are a lot of people who say, well, I really don't have any space to do anything. This backyard gardening thing is not for me. No, you can do a lot by growing plants in containers. In fact, if you're looking to grow a herb garden, containers can be an excellent way to go because you have absolute control of what's going on in terms of being clear that you have your plants separated, you know what they are, and you know what the requirements are for each, the subset of each one. But if you're going to grow in containers, you must have a sufficiently large container for the plant. A lot of people try container gardening and the, the container is basically too small for the plant that they wish to grow. Or they put too many plants in the one container that they have. And therefore, there's so much competition that there's no success. And then they may complain, well, I don't understand this. I saw that Mary Jane had time growing a container was growing very well. I tried to grow time here and it's not growing well. What happened? The other thing about container gardening, it is not a good idea to take up normal garden soil and put in a container. It hardens. Normally, you should get a soil mix a mixture that contains high organic matter, whether it is um, chicken manure, horse manure, or 
dried leaves that are rotted, compost, you should make sure that what you put into that container is a mix and not the normal soil. Otherwise, it will harden on you. Plants in containers normally require a little bit more water than plants in the soil because the container, in some cases, dries out more rapidly. And therefore, you have to pay attention to the container. Um, small hanging baskets are very susceptible to drying out. Sometimes we put plants in hanging baskets and we expect them to do well. They will not grow well unless you water them frequently because they have a tendency to dry it out. So it is not only the sun, but also the wind. <clears throat> the wind, you plant, put them in a windy area and the wind also contributes to the drying out. In a container, drainage is very important. You must provide drainage for the soil to drain Without drainage, the soil will become waterlogged and the plants will die. The holes that are in the bottom of the pot must not be blocked. In fact, when you're setting up your container garden, it is good to play, place a few stones in the bottom of the pot so as to prevent the soil from blocking the hole. A few stones and a little bit of organic matter can be a good way to start and then put the soil on top of it. In that way, you do not block the holes that provide drainage for the plant. That is a very important thing because unless you have drainage, the plants will die. The plant roots require oxygen for growth. Um, as I said, plants in containers normally require a little bit more water and sometimes more nutrients than plants in the normal bed. Let me say a word about composting. Composting is easy. In Barbados, we could reduce the amount of garbage that we send to the landfill if everyone in this country practiced composting. That is taking the organic waste from your garden and converting it into organic matter. And it is not too complicated to do. I have used the system of what I call instant composting by blending the remains from the fruit skins, the eggshells, the tea bags, etc., in water, pouring that as a slurry into soil, collecting the liquid that drains out of it to wet the plants, and then using that soil as a very rich mixture for potting plants because it contains organic matter from blending all of these things together. But if you are not uh, in possession of a blender, you can still compost by making a garden box, making a compost box out of wood, out of slabs of wood that is not, not being used for other purposes. You can build a box and put your organic waste into it, your garden clippings your eggshells, et cetera, et cetera. You will need to get a bag of rotten organic matter because every time you put the eggshells and you put the organic waste, you need to cover it with a layer of already decayed organic matter so that in fact, you bring the organisms, you bring the earthworms, you bring the bacteria, you bring the fungi to create the rotten. And you have to wet it regularly so that it's kept moist. It need moisture and it need aeration at the same time. And these things will rot rapidly. And in six months, you'll have organic matter that can be incorporated into your garden. How do you do it? In the book, I describe it, that you can use your five gallon bucket to put your organic waste into, make sure that you put holes in the bottom of it so that the, the water can run out. Or you can create a box from ordinary chicken wire. You can make it from chicken wire, hook it around. I describe it in the book. When you get the book, you'll see it. And you can put your organic waste in there and just pile it up. And after six months, you have good organic soil or organic matter to add to your garden. You start another one and you just keep going. The description of how you compost is in the book and I'll be willing to provide further information. But 
in all of this is important that you have a little understanding of the needs of plants because if you don't understand the needs of plants sometimes um, little errors that you could correct uh, become big errors plants require sunshine they require water but they also require nutrients normally the big three that plants require nitrogen phosphorus and potassium uh, we, refer to, we refer to these as NPK. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are fundamental elements for the growth of plants. But they also require what we call micronutrients. Some re plants require magnesium, some require a little chlorine, some require calcium, etc. Now, they normally get all of that from the soil. But if your soil is poor in these nutrients, then you have to add either organic matter or inorganic fertilizers. You would have known that here in Barbados, for example, we have grown sugarcane over the last, what, 300 years. And every year, the people who are growing the sugarcane add fertilizer to the soil. Why? Because as plants grow, they extract those nutrients from the soil for growth. So if you're going to plant another crop, you have to add nutrients in order to keep the soil supplied with the nutrients necessary for plant growth. If there's no nitrogen, the plants will be stunted and the leaves will get yellow. And clearly you will think that you have a disease as we describe diseases, but the plant doesn't have a disease. The plant is malnourished. Just as when we are malnourished, we do not grow, when the plant is malnourished, it is not going to grow. It's going to be stunted. It's going to get yellow. The leaves are going to be small, and you're not going to get any fruit. In fact, potassium and phosphorus are necessary for fruit setting. Nitrogen is normally associated with rapid green growth, but potassium and phosphorus are necessary for fruit set. So if you're planting tomatoes, for example, in the early stages of growth, you need nitrogen. At the later stages of growth, you need potassium and phosphorus for fruit set. And therefore, you have to follow the sequence that is necessary for the plant to produce at maximum yield. I describe some of this in the second section of my book, in which I speak about how to grow 13 common vegetables, how to grow lettuce, how to grow cabbage, how to grow sweet pepper, how to grow tomatoes. It's all described there and the sequence that you should follow in ensuring that you get a good crop. Plants basically feed by converting carbon dioxide and sunlight into carbohydrate. They attract the sunlight or trap the sunlight the chlorophyll traps the sunlight and converts carbon dioxide and the light and water into carbohydrate. This is called photosynthesis. It's the basic process by which plants grow. And they get the nutrients necessary for making the protein, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur from the soil. In the plant, all of this is fabricated. A plant is like a little factory. It's a little factory. It brings together all of these things that assemble them for growth. And if the basic requirements for growth are not provided, the plant will not grow. It remains stunted. So you have to provide the water. You have to provide the sunlight. You have to make sure there's oxygen in the root system. You have to make sure there's nitrogen. You have to make sure it's phosphorus. You have to make sure it's potassium. These are basic requirements for plant growth. And you supply these by making sure your plants are growing in an area where there's light, not under big tree, where water is available. So you supply your plant with water. Either you water it with a watering can or you use irrigation. And you have a rich soil, rich in organic matter, or you supply artificial fertilizer. 
So you have to understand the needs of the plant. And the needs of the plant is that it requires fundamental elements for growth and development. And then there's a time to harvest. And the time to harvest is something which we must pay attention to. You can't harvest too early. And you also don't want your plants to be overgrown. So in the book, I've indicated harvesting times. For lettuce, you can normally harvest in a month. Chinese cabbage, four to five weeks. Cabbage, normal cabbage, seven to eight weeks. Broccoli, seven to eight weeks. Cucumber, seven to eight weeks. Watermelon, 12 to 14 weeks. Lettuce, as I said, about four weeks. Beans, six to seven weeks. Okra, 11 weeks about. And tomatoes, 10 to 12 weeks. I've written all this because it gives you an idea of how long your plant is going to need your attention in the ground before you can harvest. It also allows you to plan your rotation. If you know that the tomato crop is going to take 10 weeks, then you can plan what are you going to plant before and after that, so that you plan your rotation and you're able to rotate your plants. Now, there's a lot that I could talk about. And we have spoken a lot already. I believe that this subject cannot be covered in a one hour Sunday afternoon session. There's too much information to share. There is a lot we need to understand in order to be successful in growing a garden. I would like to encourage you once the book is available to get a copy and read it. But I would also like to encourage Keisha to arrange other seminars so that we can get together and answer questions and bring to the table your experience in growing plants so that we can uh, have a dialogue and have a conversation as to what are the problems that you have encountered and how we can help solve those problems together. Because at the end of the day, growing of plants is like taking care of a baby. There are continuous experiences. And every day you learn something new that you can share that is important for success. So I would not long to prolong this anymore at this stage. I would like again to thank Keisha for this opportunity to say these few words, to tell you that we are preparing a book on the topic and to invite you to begin to grow some of your own food, even if it's one plant to start with. With time, with, you'll be successful with one and you can grow more. But don't be trapped in this modality of importing everything and growing everything from over and away. We have great things here in this country. I always say our Barbados cherry contains a hundred times more vitamin C than an orange. Our breadfruit, our bananas, our yams, our sweet potato, vitally nutritious for us. And so we have to grow more and consume more of our own food. With those few words, I wish to say good afternoon to you all. And I wish you well in your gardening endeavors. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Dr. Brathwaite, thank you so very much for that. Very passionate advocating for um, everybody to start their own gardens. I can tell you that I feel very inspired. Um, so we just a couple questions. I know some people have really wanted to ask a couple questions. So we're just going to take a few. So let me just go to a couple questions that were in the chat. I saw someone asking about any tips on growing strawberries. I had heard about strawberries growing in Barbados and I was skeptical, but apparently it's true. You can grow strawberries here. Do you know anything about that or? I have a strawberry in my garden. Is it growing good? right here in Clermont. It is not flowering yet, but um, I have a strawberry and I'm hoping to get some fruit from it. 
So once you follow these tips, a strawberry, the strawberries should grow because they're a plant like all the rest. So it should be okay. Well, the, the basic requirements for plant is that you have to have the right temperature, the right nutrients, the right environment for the plant to grow. Um, someone gave me this plant and I'm not sure whether it is um, the typical northern strawberry or if it's a, a variety that will develop in the tropics. Uh -huh. The fact uh -huh. is that we have developed varieties in the tropics that are very suitable to our conditions. A classic example have been soybean. In the old days, soybean was only grown in the northern climates, in the cool climates. And the research that was carried out in Brazil, they were able to develop soybean that grows well in the tropical environment. So the systems are changing. As we learn more and more about plants, and we do genetic engineering, and we do breeding, et cetera, we have been able to produce plants that are more suitable to our environment. Okay, lovely. I see here the soil conservation sells the strawberries, and they're also growing grapes and dragon fruit as well. Yes. Okay. Lovely. Okay, so that's something to look into and to know that you can't just take any old strawberries. It should be strawberries suitable to the tropics. Yes. So I also saw another question about how can it, can people ensure that their composting does not become a haven for rodents? Um, rodents are a problem. And of course, you have to put in place whatever measures you can to keep the rodents away, whether you compost or you don't compost. As a matter of fact, even if you're not composed, the rodents are a problem. So you have to put out your, your rat bait or get a trap to control the rodents. Uh, but if you are composting, you are even more inclined to control the rodents by putting down a little rat bait around the, around the um, compost bin. Of course, you have to be if you have dogs, you have to be careful that you do not expose the dogs to the rat bait because some of these rat baits are poisonous to dogs. Yeah. So that is some a precaution which you have to take into consideration. But yes, if you're going to compost well, you have to take care of the rodents. I agree. Just so you have to look after the monkeys. Yeah. You have to take all the necessary precautions to protect what you're doing. Very sensible. Oh, okay, another question, just a couple more and then we're gonna let everybody go because we've been on for a little bit now. Um, I see um, someone says they want to plant um, in their husband's old boots, but they're wondering if the roots are going to be okay growing in the boots or do they have to remove the seedling after it has shoot? Um, you can only plant uh, short-term crops in a shoe because of the limited size and the limited amount of soil. And you can only put one plant in. So this is not for everything. I can plant a lettuce or a Chinese cabbage in my shoes, but clearly you're not going to be able to plant a cabbage or a crop which and pee in your shoe. That's not going to work. Thank you. And would they have to make holes in the boots? You make holes in the boots, of course, because you want drainage. You're right. You have to put schools so the water can come out. Okay. Um, I see one last question that here. If um, I have a container herb garden, is rotation of crops necessary? It is still necessary because you don't want to be planting the same thing in the same soil all the time. Otherwise, you get a build up pests of that particular plant. So if you had time in that plant this time, plant marjoram the next time, right? And then you can go back and plant time afterward. After a crop of marjoram, you can plant time again, but it's always good to break the cycle. It allows the soil to be enriched because you use different elements in the soil, but it also breaks the cycle of pests and diseases. Good one, Bert. That's very interesting to learn about this ecosystem. I didn't know that it was so sophisticated before. Um, Keisha, okay. Keisha, hi Keisha, it's Kelly. Hello, before, before, Kelly Boye, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. I know you, we are wrapping up. I have a quick question. Please go ahead. What, what is Dr. Braffitt's experience with the huge, huge influx of monkeys on home gardening? 
because I'm having a tr I'm having a huge challenge with monkeys. I can't plant anything. What does he recommend? So I'm very you... aware of the I'm very aware of the monkey problem. <laughs> in fact, here in Clermont, if I did not take appropriate measures, I would not be able to plant anything either. But right. I have built a small monkey proof greenhouse. It is it has chicken wire all around. It is 30 feet by 30 feet. It has chicken wire all around and chicken wire at the top to keep out the monkeys. So in that way, I have solved my problem. Now, I am not sure that everyone can do that. But the monkey problem in Barbados is a serious problem that requires appropriate and immediate action. Yep. It is becoming one of the limiting factors to agricultural production in the country. And okay. I understand from reliable sources that the ministry is developing a program for monkey control. Okay. Well, my, my case is that I have a plum tree in the backyard and I like it's you know it's it has a it's right now it's you know in in bearing it's there are a lot of there are a lot of plums, but the monkeys I can't get it you know I don't get any because the monkeys just come and destroy them. Well, I have a mango tree and I don't get any mangoes either. I, well, I have also I, yeah I also have a mango tree and I have the same problem with the monkeys. Same problem. Oh dear. We were chatting about that earlier before the Zoom started and somebody suggested about a bionic monkey. <laughs> <laughs> somebody said that a bionic <laughs> Somebody also suggested birth control of the monkey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Monkey's birth control. <laughs> hey, listen, once we put our heads together, human beings are smarter than monkeys. For so some monkey. innovative ideas exactly. for controlling the monkey population. I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, very last um, question. And that's a bit of a, well, my one of my neighbors, she swears by urine for plants. What do you think about that? What kind of urine? Human urine, but diluted to a certain, for the pH. I, I do not recommend it for mainly cultural reasons, because um, I don't think that the average person would be excited about this possibility. On the other hand, you must recognize that when you use cow manure, for example, to put it in the soil, that is derived from both the solid and the liquid products of the cow. But in the case of human beings, I do not recommend human products or plants. Thank you so very much for that, Dr. Brathwaite. And I just want to let everybody that's still here know that um, once Dr. Brathwaite's book is released, that we will be purchasing quite a few and we would be we would love to give out some of them so just stay posted on the forlum foundation facebook for any updates on that and we would like to give out these books to you so because i think it would be very useful and helpful and we need it so thank you so much dr rafik for coming on and sharing thank you for having me. experience with us I thoroughly enjoyed this and I learned something and we got some great tips and I agree we have to do this again because one Zoom is not enough to gather enough information. I, I filled an entire page making notes here. So <laughs> we must do this again and we'll do it more open to everyone where they can talk about their gardens. Maybe they could share little pictures or maybe some short videos of what they're doing. I know from after today's session, I am going to start my own garden. So I will be able to share that with you when we have our another Zoom on this. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. And thank you for coming out. And have a great Sunday afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you.
Hi, Yvonne. Bye. <laughs> bye, Alan. Bye, Paula. Oh, thank you so much, Sharice. I'm okay, so bye, Dr. Bradford. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Have bye. a great afternoon, everyone. Bye, you guys. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Later, guys. Next Zoom.